Thank you uh, for joining us, uh, Professor um, Liu and uh, Professor Wee. Um, perhaps we'll just start with you first, uh, Professor Liu, you know, because you saw Singapore through the SARS outbreak in, uh, in 2003. So when COVID-19 basically hit our shores in 2020, you know, was it sort of like a deja vu moment for you where you felt like, oh, here we go again, you know, and that's on top of NCID, you know, you just had set up this 330 uh, bed facility. I'm just wondering what, what went through your head. Well, indeed, it's uh, almost like a deja vu. It's like, oh, you know, it's, it's uh, something that very similar again. And I think that is also a very wrong assumption because as we learn, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is very different from SARS-CoV-1 uh, that caused the 203 uh, SARS outbreak. And I think that the uh, assumptions uh, initially possibly caused us a little bit of the um, misjudgment. Uh, and fortunately, I think uh, with the research and ability to gather the information and data as quickly mm -hmm. as we can, uh, we managed to understand the SARS-CoV-2 uh, quick enough for us to be flexible enough to adjust some of the preventive and management measures. Mm. And at what point, you know, during the first few months when you were hit by this, did you go like, oh, oh, this is really serious? Professor Wee? Yeah, I, I was actually in France when the first case of um, COVID was reported in, in Singapore. I remember getting a text from a, a colleague in Singapore General Hospital. Um, and I was in France for a meeting on dengue. Uh, and I remember be, when we were there, you know, there was one morning where actually we were more ex uh, keen to follow what was going on in WHO when you were talking about whether to um, declare emergency uh, public health measures uh, rather than discussing about dengue. Mm -hmm. And that was my, you know, the first um, uh, kind of time I kind of be aware that this is going to be beyond the shores of China. Mm -hmm. um, but at that time, I, I you know, like, like what, uh, Professor Leo said, um, I thought that this would be like SARS, that this would be contained quite quickly. And mm. actually in Singapore, it would be quite safe because post-SARS, you know, we, we, there were a lot of um, infection control measures already established in the hospital. Mm. So I actually didn't think that it was <laughs> going to be so big. Until, Nobody did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. until about March, mid-March. Mm. And then, you know, when it started to get to Europe and what was happening in Italy, then after that, Spain and then North America. And I thought, OK, I think this is now out of hand. Mm. That this is probably going to go beyond a point where we can actually eliminate this virus from the human population and mm. perhaps limit it to the animal mm. population. I think it was about mid-March when that right. for me. Yeah. And Prof. Leo, when, when did the alarm bells really started going, uh, you know, for you? Well, it was actually December uh, the year uh, before that, mm. I think it's uh, 2018. <laughs> now mm. I'm beginning to lose uh, track 19. of my time. 20, 2019. 19, yeah. Yeah. And uh, when we first heard about this unusual outbreak and unusual cases in, in, in China, mm. uh, Wuhan, right? Mm -hmm. um, it actually sounded something rather unusual at a point in time. And uh, we were just watch, watching out for more information to come, whether or not there was human-to-human -human transmissions. Because indeed, if it is evidence at that showing human-to-human -human transmissions, then I think it's very likely that Singapore will not be spared because we you know from the past experience. And also we know that the hu human population uh, movement between the two countries is actually very, very high. Um, so when we watched that very carefully, and the first signal that came out actually uh, was a family who had uh, contacts with the markets, mm -hmm. but the rest of the other family members are just basically home dweller, mm -hmm. and they were infected. And that was actually the first signal. And that signal basically uh, sound the alarm to many of us that this is likely a human-to-human -human transmissions. Uh, but it was very, very confusing during the period because a lot of the experts uh, declared that there was actually no human-to-human -human transmission. It was so, so... <laughs> Um, mm. certain yeah. that uh, yeah. it was just restricted uh, transmissions with a very small number of people. Yeah. Um, but it's only when later on WHO came out uh, to be sharing the information mm. that, that, that indeed is human-to-human -human transmissions. And that was a point that we realised that Singapore is in it. Now I'm going to talk about, you know, how when Singapore went into circuit breaker, right? I mean, essentially, mm -hmm. it was a lockdown. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people got to work from home. Some people think, yay, it's great. But, you know, both of you, you're on the front lines. You know, I can't even imagine what it's like, um, 
you know, working day in, day out, the kind of highs and lows that you have to go through. And perhaps, um, Professor Wee, you want to just tell us what does a typical day look like for you in terms of the number of hours you clock, you know, in terms of, I mean, do you even have any me time, even time with your family? Yeah, I mean, for for me, I guess, you know, the by that time, we were basically trying to work on a vaccine uh, and, and uh, at least develop one in Singapore in the case that in, in the event that when a vaccine becomes available, those that countries that produce it will hoard it for themselves mm. and, and the rest of the world will not have it. Um, so, and, and as a context, my lab actually works on dengue, not actually on vaccine, mm. but because this is a RNA vaccine and the genome of dengue virus is an RNA uh, genome, then I, I think we can draw some parallel and from there build on what we uh, have learned from dengue and yellow fever vaccine, which is a cousin of dengue, mm. uh, towards working on this vaccine. So for, for, for me, I mean, I go into the lab every day um, because, you know, some we, we need to be there to see what's going on. Um, but the work actually technically starts the minute I wake up because you start thinking about, well, how can I make this? How can I do this better? We have When you encounter a problem, how do I solve this problem? Uh, you know, how do I take this to the next stage? If the if the the experiments don't turn out turn out the way we think it should, then how do I solve it? What's the next step? Mm -hmm. Right, you start thinking about this, and when you start eat, you know have your first cup of coffee, you know when you're brushing your teeth, mm -hmm. washing up, and then by the time you get to the office, you know you've like cleared your email over coffee and all that. When you hit the office, you're thinking, okay, what what's a new data that's coming out from the lab? How do I now make sense of what we're doing? Uh, can we do this better and all that? How does this fare against what other, uh, mm. what what other people are reporting? So, how many hours are we looking at? Like, yeah. you know, uh, let's just talk at the, at the height, you know, of 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 COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Were you clocking like 12, 14, 16 hours hours a day? So I I I, I get up about what, before seven six thirty seven, yeah. uh, and I don't go bed to bed uh, till about twelve, wow. and in between it's just the meals that you don't. Maybe you have a bit of social and the shower time. as well. Yeah, <laughs> but the rest of the time you're you're thinking about what, how to make this. Yeah. I mean the 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 pressure is there, right? You had to do this in such a short time yeah. that whatever that would normally, you know, comfortably even when you're trying to um, uh, do this as quickly as possible, it is is a project that typically would take a year or so. Right. And now you're trying to push it into within four months. Mm. So you know the, it, it's I guess it comes down to detail. How do we get from point A to point B in as short a time as possible. Mm. And, and Professor Leo, like for you as well, I, I, I gather that you have a lot of dealings with, you know, Western uh, counterparts like, you know, in Europe and US and obviously the time difference means that you probably have very little sleep yourself. Well, essentially, yes, I would say because uh, in order for us to gather more of the uh, sharing of information, uh, I, I still remember that uh, um, when Singapore was hit by COVID-19, in fact, a lot of cases already being reported, especially in US. Um, and and th those were the periods where every one of us was trying to learn from one another, trying to get get, uh, get as much information and engage mm -hmm. the situations as much as possible. And I still remember that uh, it was uh, Chinese New Year, the New Year's Eve. And uh, usually we have family gathering and have family mm -hmm. dinner. But that was also the time where I attended the first WHO Clinical Network meeting um, and trying to understand the, the presentations of the cases, especially in, in the US, uh, and also what would be the therapeutic strategies uh, that uh, they were thinking of at the point in time. So essentially, yes, you are right that uh, during the day, it's basically uh, fighting fire, looking after patients, make sure the whole uh, workflows it's efficient mm -hmm. enough for us to be able to take, take care of the patients safely in, in a way. But nighttime is a time where we connect up with the Western world, uh, exchange information as well as providing information to strengthen the entire network in terms of how we deal with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And what about mm -hmm. your family? I mean, you know, you're on the front lines. You're also putting your, your life, you know, at risk, right? I mean, because, you know, you, you also have to see patients and things like that. And you also have to deal with other infectious diseases at the same time. Um, I suppose how, you know, it takes time away from, from your family. And how, how did, how, how, you know, 
How did you handle that? I think maybe Professor Leo is further in the front line than me in seeing the patient side. I don't actually see any patients right now. Um, but I guess, you know, we've we've kind of lived this life for, you know, decades now. So, and this is not the first outbreak. And this is not the first time where, you know, that there is a, in a way, a race towards something, mm. right? So I think at least for speaking for myself, I think the, the family understands and very supportive about mm. what we do now. Obviously, there are those times where, you know, you get these comments where, you know, you're not around, right? So, yeah, yeah but I, I think it, it, it's some, some, sometimes it's just set out of frustration. It's not that, you know, mm. this is uh, a complaint. Mm. They understand what we're going through. Um, but yeah, they've they've been extremely supportive. I mean, if had they not been that supportive, I think this is not this would not have been possible. In in terms of like your emotions, right, going through, you have your highs and you have your lows. Were there any point did you feel like you know because we we're not sure you know um, different countries are coming up with various mm-hmm. data and we're trying to ascertain you know where, where where what Singapore should do. Did you ever feel like you know like life was just like a roller coaster, but you have no seatbelt on? Did you feel that, uh, Professor Leo? Well, life is a roller coaster during that period. There's a lot of up and there's a lot of down. Uh, but I must say that uh, the seatbelt is always there. Just have to fasten it up. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, it was like you're trying to build a plane and you're flying it at all at the same time, right? The in the what you're trying to learn how, what would what would it take to make a would. What would it take for a good vaccine to work, or what mm. would it take for a vaccine to work against COVID? Right, and there's data coming out from labs. Some of it is really good. Some of it isn't so good. But you need you still need to read it, go into the detail before you decide whether this is something that is reliable, trustable, mm. that you will put your money on, or this is something that it isn't going to fly. This is not something that you know we want to uh, in uh, uh, pivot on. But in all that whilst your own experiment is going, uh, mm. uh, uh, running at the same time. So there is a lot of adjustment, a lot of fine-tuning as mm. you as you go yeah. along. Because uh, Singapore, we became the first country in Southeast Asia to start this COVID-19 mm-hmm. vaccination campaign. And, um, you know, I mean, to, to, to be bold enough to say that, you know, we are going to take the lead uh, in the region. Uh, you know, you have to make that decision, which is which which sits very heavily on your shoulders. Because if anything goes wrong, and there was a lot of there was a certain amount of vaccine hesitancy, you know, during that period as well. Mm-hmm. So that must have been quite stressful. Probably, Prof Leo is mm-hmm. closer to that decision than me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I think um, mRNA vaccine is is something that uh, perhaps most people not so familiar uh, at that time. But in, in actual fact, it's not. A very very new technology has been used in in other areas like cancer area in particular. Uh, but uh, the challenging things I, I I just want to say perhaps I should um, I, I should give credit to many of my colleagues. Uh, in in fact, even before mRNA vaccines became available, uh, there were a lot of discussions in terms of detailing uh, the technical aspect of it and how safe that uh, the vaccines can be. And I would say that uh, the organizations of a very specific group of the colleagues that look deeper into the vaccine efficacy, vaccine safety, that uh, they're able to pinpoint where Singapore should put the investment mm. to bring in the vaccine as early as possible. And they identify mRNA vaccine is, is one of the, the best uh, potential candidates that uh, we should put the, uh, the focus on. And I think that that part of the work, I think we need to give credit to this very specific mm. group of the colleagues who spend a lot of time uh, looking into what would be the best uh, for Singapore. And I also want to say that it is also a very bold investment because we invested in mRNA vaccine even before it became commercially available. And that's also the reason why Singapore can bring in the first lot of vaccine into Singapore mm. and we became the first country to deliver the mRNA vaccine in Southeast Asia. Mm. Um, and I, for us as a clinicians on the ground, we are basically the recipients. We are more downstream. So for us is to determine how are we going to deliver, how are we going to administer mm. the vaccine. And I must say that we are very fortunate to have a group of uh, colleagues who actually put up their hand to be the first group of people to receive mRNA vaccine mm. in, in NCID. Mm. And they also give us the ability to look into how to operationalize vaccine administrations and be able to scale it up 
mm-hmm. uh, subsequently in many of the yeah. vaccination centers. I, I think with, I mean, NCID, um, specific to, you know, NCID, they, they, there was so much stuff going on. I mean, they have to do research, they have to house all these clinical services. And on hindsight now, I mean, just looking back, right, do you think that NCID was simply overburdened and um, the, 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 there's just a limited amount of resources well, I, then I want to refer back to uh, my colleagues, my close colleagues that we really work hand in hand uh, during the the, the the height of the uh, COVID-19. Whatever comes, we just have to take it on. And that mm. is the spirit that we have. Um, and and that is the, the collegial part of it that we all want to support one another to get mm. through yeah. uh, all these difficulties and challenges. We do not know what is going to come. Uh, basically, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is... is very unpredictable virus, and we see a lot of, uh, you know, turning point um, by by the virus. Uh, we do not know what is going to come, but we are determined to take it on, whatever that's going to come. Yeah, I, I can, you know, you can see the resilience that you have even three years, you know, after COVID, and you're still talking with it with so much, you know, heart and passion. And I assume that now, um, you know, sort of post COVID, we can, you can sort of perhaps take a breather, a little one, and just sort of reflect. And I wonder when you're looking back at those years, right, what was any key moment or any key takeaway you had where you know that, you know, will stay with you for a very, very long time to come? Wow, good question. Hadn't thought of that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's a great question. I I guess if if, if I, I may step back a bit, to the mRNA vaccine um, question earlier, um, the 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 world has actually worked on a DNA vaccine for a long time, right? And and why? Because you know you store the genetic material in DNA, and it works perfectly in 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 experimental models and all that. Except that when you take this to clinical trials, it just failed poorly, uh, or rather, it failed very badly. So then, you know, when mRNA vaccine became uh, a, th- a thing, I mean, it's being pr- uh, uh, proposed, it, it kind of fr- scientifically became quite uh, interesting to ask, right? It, if where Can mRNA succeed where DNA has failed? Um, actually, logically, it, w- it could because a lot of the virus, including SARS uh, cor- cor- uh, coronavirus 2, has an RNA genome, right? And, and our bodies actually for most of us we tolerate quite well right mm-hmm. so um, you know qu- question then therefore is can we then adapt this and, and take now turn it to our advantage and mm-hmm. protect us from from infection um, I think it's just seeing the signs through that whatever the, all the things that we have learned all the things that we have uh, experimented with and now you're seeing it in fruition in human mm-hmm. I think was was uh, was very satisfying Mm. Right, we we weren't the first to uh, do a self amplifying or self replicating mRNA vaccine. I think the Imperial College team were faster than us, uh, was faster than us. But nonetheless, I think we we were, uh, you know, when we were doing it, we were amongst the first to be doing this. Mm. Right, it, it had that kind of pioneering um, uh, spirit, kind of uh, uh, element to it. Right, mm. so that yeah, it was hard work. It it took really long hours, but. You, you can see this, and for a, for a, you know, I, I train as a clinician, and then by, I I spend my time doing research. But you know, for 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 me personally, this this is exactly why I got into research, right? To bring science into the clinic. Um, that part is is extremely extremely satisfying. Mm, very well yeah. said. And uh, Professor Leo, when when was the moment where you're the moment that you're most proud of? I think every there moment, are too many moments. Yeah, there are right? so many moments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever there's a moment that uh, we feel that we know our enemy, uh, which is the SARS-CoV-2, a little bit better, and there is new evidence coming out, and that new evidence may be able to support us in terms of uh, management policies as well as uh, prevention policies that make a significant impact. That will be uh, the proud moment. Uh, so, yeah, as mm. I say, not many prop moments along the way. Mm. And I'm sure also many lessons learned, right? So, um, in terms of what do you think is that one thing or that would have helped you fight COVID-19 better? I mean, it's obviously, mm. it's it's a lot easier to say it on hindsight. But, you know, what was the what was the, that takeaway? I, I think for, uh, uh, you know, one of the things I learned from 
uh, vaccine, developing, well, working on this vaccine, is that at, at least for now, you cannot replace that big financial po uh, um, pocket that you need to finish the race, right? So uh, uh, for us, we partnered with a biotech, Arcturus Therapeutics, a, co a company based in San Diego. It is in a clinical stage, right? But it doesn't actually have a product just yet. So there are several in, in clinical um, trials. So it, it, it's, its pocket is not as deep as BioNTech or Pfizer, mm. not as deep as Moderna. Moderna had a lot of um, investors and all that. That to finish this race, that last spurt needs a lot of money. So, so it took what, us how much time are we, to how much are we talking about? To give, give you an idea, just to do the... Uh, phase three clinical trial in different countries because that's what regulators want to mm -hmm. see that this, you can get similar results across different places, races and ethnic groups and all that. To do that, you need a, someone to coordinate the clinical trial. To pay someone to coordinate a clinical trial of that size takes $100 million. You have not made any vaccine, mm -hmm. you have not recruited any page, uh, subjects, you have not done any tests. Just to appoint someone to coordinate a trial is $100 million. You need mm. very deep pockets at that last stretch, right? So the early part where we are doing just to show that this potentially could work, uh, getting into phase one, phase two, we can do that at the scale that we're, we're, we've, we've operated mm -hmm. on. But that last stretch is is a race for Olympians, wow. right? So I, I think, you know, for, for me, think if, if this were to happen again, we, we need that pocket. Otherwise, we will mm. again come out short in a final stretch. Mm. And uh, yourself, uh, what, what's the one thing that we could have done better? Oh, <laughs> I, I think it's, it's <clears throat> time for us to also reflect in terms of what would be the area that uh, we need to focus on in terms of uh, building up uh, the, the entire system. <clears throat> um, I think there are a lot of lessons Mm. along the way uh, what keep us actually going is actually the people people that are willing to work together for towards a common goal mm. um, I don't have any staff coming over to me to say that they are just not able to continue in fact uh, we have many of the colleagues never even say a single word and we're just coming together uh, together and work together so even yeah. though they are burnt out because, you know, the healthcare system, and not just Singapore, everywhere else in the world, um, you, you know, suffer from burnout, which is actually uh, quite a serious issue in the healthcare sector. Is that something that you are perhaps worried about as well? Well, I mean, burnout is just an expression. It's just extreme uh, tiredness mm -hmm. and fatigue, right? But I think the more important thing is what were you doing at the point in time? What is the meaning of your work? And I think many of us are able to continue on in a very resilient way to be able to overcome many of the uh, challenges. Uh, so looking back, you know, I, I, I can see, yes, we all are human and we all feel tired, uh, not only physically, mentally as well. This is very draining uh, period. Uh, but when you look around, you see all your colleagues are there for you, with you, and for the patients and with the patients. Then I think that kind of atmosphere and morale is actually very mm. different. So what is the one thing that you did for yourself, right, to keep your energy level up, to keep yourself physically fit? Because that's what you have to be, physically fit and mentally fit. Well, you have to prep yourself. Basically, you know, we as the persons that need to rally the entire teams together, no matter how tired you are, look fresh. Mm. Mm. And yes, and uh, for people to look at you and be able to feel your energy, uh, and be able yeah, to but did you like take you? any uh, you know special supplement or <laughs> <laughs> or uh, you know or drinks or coffee or you know? Well, I have quite a lot of people actually send me quite a lot of things. You know, like you know all these <laughs> brand sessions of chickens and whatnot, all the tonic <laughs> things. They just send it over to our office. But I think the other morale booster is actually from the community because uh, you know we receive a lot of all these supplement, food, a gift from the community. Mm. I think those are very very encouraging. Mm. And uh, yourself, Professor? Yeah, I think for me it was, uh, you know, that my, my colleagues uh, at, at work, right? Um, I mean, in, in um, pre-COVID, pre we, many of us work on 
various aspects of, say, you know, dengue or other diseases, and we we don't really step on each other's toes, right? We all work on our little uh, area of interest and all that. But of course, COVID changed a lot of things. So now you had to bring different groups, different people together, bring out different expertise, and now mm-hmm. start working together. And I think from there we've built built some really um, uh, interesting and very uh, fruitful collaborations, right? For instance. I have a colleague who who works on hepatitis B, mm. right? And he looks at certain aspects of an immune response to hepatitis B uh, virus and, and why some people get chronic hepatitis and cancer. Right? Uh, but COVID is a completely different disease, but he made a lot of advances in trying to un- un- understand, especially the T-cell response to COVID, right? And, and because of vaccines are also, uh, you know, triggering T-cells, then... It's, it's a great partnership. And that partnership is now stretched on to now tackling other aspects of, you know, uh, medical um, challenges, right? Uh, and it, yeah, I think it, it's partnerships like that that then takes us from from both a professional capacity as well as, you know, friendship and mm. camaraderie and all that into a, a different level. And I think that that keeps going, you, knowing that you're, you're not in this alone. There are many others and, and you can count on them when you need help and... Mm. And like and vice versa. And I think since I think COVID, you know, struck a lot of people, you know, in Singapore, everywhere else, is this general sense that you know, like life is short. Anything can happen, you know, in a in a very short span of time. And uh, a prime minister has talked about, you know, the next the next disease X, right, or something that mm-hmm. comes along. So to help us better prepare for the next pandemic, what is the one thing you would change in terms of managing infectious uh, diseases today? Professor Leo? I think a lot of things that uh, <clears throat> we need to look into how we can put in place into strengthening the the entire system. I think one of the things that we can do uh, be better is how we connect up with our own community as well as uh, connect up uh, with the external as well. Uh, with our own community, essentially, uh, that I, I feel that uh, many of the, uh, com- uh, the communications messages that we need to send out to the g- general publics, because everybody is hungry for information, hungry to know more uh, about the conditions. And of course, there's elements of fear, because it's something new, right? And it is how can we bring a message and bring uh, the community closer? Uh, and how can we then combat uh, the kind of misinformation? Uh, mm. And, and mm. I think that is uh, one of the very important elements to build the kind of connections and trust during peacetime. And during the outbreak, it's much easier for this uh, information to grow. Within the entire healthcare system, I think we can continue to build up the human capital especially for certain pockets uh, of the uh, human capitals. Those are highly trained individuals. It's very hard to replace them. Mm. For example, intensive care uh, physicians or intensivists. Those are the highly skilled people, uh, doctors and nurses. You can't find them and you can't grow them within a month or or even within a year. So those will be the group that we have to look into. How can we build up this very precious um, human resources and be able to uh, retain them yeah. uh, within uh, the system. And of course, you know, uh, now we are moving into the next era. We have to look and see how can we further strengthen our civilian system. It's just like the the, the white paper that just came out. Yep. Uh, that we need to look mm. into how can we continue to build up uh, the entire capability, looking into better prevention strategies, surveillance, and how can we better respond mm. in the future. Mm. Resource becomes something that's very important. And not only we have to have new resources, but we have yeah. to sustain, you know, the warmness mm. and of the entire system. Correct. And we also yeah. need deep pockets, right? Yeah. Really yeah. Deep, deep pockets. Deep pockets. Investments, <laughs> right? To be prepared. Um, and I think for, for me, uh, you know, following on from what Prof. Leo has said, um, if we want to respond, I mean, fast to the to, uh, next pandemic with new vaccines, new drugs and all that, for me, we have to change the way we approve drugs and vaccines. And I think, you know, the 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 conventional method of approving, I, a lot, actually, a lot of advances were made during COVID because of the emergency, right? But it's still, that there's a, to get from A to E, you have to pass through B, C, D. 
But if I can do A at the A plus level, very rich in data that gives you a lot of confidence in what this product is, whether it's going to be able to work, is it going to be safe, then I should be able to skip B, C, D and go straight to E.